Yo, what's up everyone? How are we all doing? Back with a video and uh, a brand new video by Oversimplified. So, uh, you know, go check that out. Give it a like and a subscribe. Just, you know, it's his work at the end of the day. I'm just reacting. But, uh, yeah, hope you're all doing well. I'm about to go get into the Prohibition. Now, I know a little bit about the Prohibition. Is it uh, 1920 to, you know, 1935? 35, no, 33, 1933. I know, you know, just anyone that's ever watched a Mafia movie knows about the Prohibition. Uh, you know, part of the Noble Experiment. Get all of that. So, uh, let's see let's see what we got. I don't I don't know what time periods it's covering. I imagine it's going to do the whole thing because it's a 33 minute video, but let's get straight into it because I ain't too sure. Good morning, honey. What's for breakfast? The usual. Two caskets of rum, a mug of hard cider, and a full bottle of wine. Oh boy! <laughs> oh, I'm running late. I'll have to take it with me. Don't forget your lunch. It's a six pack of beer, a flask of whiskey, six shots of tequila, and as a special treat, a banana. Aw, oh, gee whiz. I'm gonna be smashed today. Enjoy your day of operating sharp, dangerous farm equipment. I can't believe this is an acceptable way to live. God bless America. God okay, bless America. gotta go. I love my life. Pretty much. You know the uh, funniest. American. The funniest thing was it was meant to reduce crime. <laughs> the land of beautiful strip malls, top-class infrastructure, and wonderful urban sprawl. Ah yes, beautiful America. But what's the most American thing you can think of? The Statue of Liberty, Mount Rushmore, a Jeez, crazy Vegas. lady in a mobility scooter yelling at a pigeon. Well, what if I told you the answer is alcohol? That's right. When the Puritans arrived on America's shores, they brought a ship packed with beer. George Washington provided his men with a daily cup of whiskey. Andrew Jackson's inauguration party left the White House so trashed that everybody had to be ordered outside. Frederick Douglass said whiskey made him feel like a president. Me too, Frederick. Me too. <laughs> Americans drink a breakfast. Doctors prescribe their patients hard liquor. In the 19th century, Americans drank three times as much as their modern day counterparts. That's a lot of whiskey. Jesus. Hey Jerry, how's that report coming along? Already done, sir. I've also organized your paperwork, watered your flowers, and been a father figure to your children. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Have you been drinking at work? No, sir, I would never. Well, why not? Everyone else is doing it. But I got all my work done. You're fired! <laughs> Americans drink at work. They drink at barn raisings, baptisms, and public hangings. Heavy drinking was so normal that it was as American as apple pie. <sighs> Hi, everyone. My name's Ron, and I'm an alcoholic. Get over yourself, Ron. We're all alcoholics. But more and more Americans began to wonder whether all of this truly was a normal way to live. Were Americans drinking, perhaps, a little too much? Well, one group in particular thought the answer to that was yes. You know him, you love him. The Catholics? Woman. Uh. Oh, crap, uh. woman! Run! <laughs> Hang on. We just want to talk. Woman talking in public? That's outrageous. Come on, Fred. You've got two kids and a wife at home, yet here you are spending your entire paycheck on booze. Mm -hmm. And you, Dr. Spanky, you were on the cusp of discovering time travel. But what did you discover instead? The sweet, sweet joys of whiskey. That's right. Alcohol. It's destroying our families, our jobs, and our homes. She's right. She's right. You know. Hang on, men. Don't let them get to you. This saloon is our safe space where our wives and children can't annoy us with reality. Where we're free to be real men. She's right. She's right. I am a and what is it real men do? Take care of their families. I don't know what she's talking about. Oh, you take care of your families? Yes. No. We drink beer, we shoot guns, and we mud wrestle. <laughs> As America's heavy drinking ruined more and more lives, moral resistance began to arise, and women were at the forefront, taking matters into their own hands at a time when women doing just about anything. Women. Hey man, what did we say a few videos ago? In the French and the Russian revolutions, women have led the way. You know, it, it, this, is a, this is a global thing. Shocking. They'd had enough of being victim to their husband's heavy drinking, and they were gonna do something unprecedented. You're going to what? I'm going to protest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweetie. Hey, do you want to know the best thing? If it wasn't for a woman, Riley Rogers, I wouldn't be reacting to this because I didn't know it'd come out. So shout out to her, her and women. Women can't protest. Whoa. 
Starting in Ohio, before spreading nationwide, women began a crusade against alcohol. They marched through towns and cities, singing hymns, gathering outside saloons, and praying on their knees. Women praying was so terrifying that in some towns, schools were shut and business stagnated. On one occasion, firemen were called out to hose down no the way. praying women. On another, the owner of a beer garden reportedly holed a cannon outside and threatened to reduce the savage woman to dust. Nevertheless, they persisted. They formed the WCTU in 1874, and they organized. They set up homes for inebriate women. They installed water fountains in public parks. They wrote textbooks for school children that contained some interesting claims about drinking alcohol. Here's little Timmy. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Looks like Timmy's gonna have his first drink. He's taking a small sip of whiskey, and Timmy has spontaneously combusted. The end. The woman's efforts weren't Sounds in vain. Legit. In small towns across America, drugstores agreed to stop fulfilling prescriptions for alcohol. Men committed themselves to giving up drink. Inspired by the woman's moral fervor, some saloon owners closed their doors. The woman's crusade Damn. and other temperance movements were forcing people to reconsider alcohol's role in society, and more people began to side with the growing temperance movement. Many states had even begun enacting their own dry laws that restricted the sale and use of alcohol. Are you taught this in schools? Like how the prohibition come out and the big effect that women had in driving it. Sorry. I, I never knew this. I never knew women had such a big role to play in the prohibition. Um, I just thought it was like a directive from, you know, top to bottom. I didn't think it was bottom to top, you know? One of them was Kansas, where alcohol had been outlawed since 1881. Despite this, many illegal saloons remained open, and authorities had done just about nothing to stop them. One woman, disgusted by what she saw, decided she would take the law into her own hands. And not just any woman, a terrifying, hatchet-wielding, sweet old lady named Carrie Nation. Our you know, I was just about to say, I've just realized, this is a revolution from the ground up by Karens. And then... When he said her name, I thought she her name was going to be Karen. Yo, that is so funny. Karens have actually changed the world into the prohibition. That's brilliant. A terrifying, hatchet-wielding, sweet old lady named Carrie Nation. Armed with her trusty hatchet and a bag of what she called smashers, she traveled from town to town visiting saloons. But she wasn't there to get smashed. She was there to smash. The men could do nothing but cower as sweet little Carrie hulked out and tore the place to shreds. She went to Kiowa and smashy smashed. Wichita, smashy smash. Topeka, smashy smash. On a couple of occasions, she was arrested, but each time they were like, okay, Carrie, we're gonna let you go so long as you promise to be a good girl and not smash up any more saloons, okay? Screw you, pig! <laughs> yeah. I think she's gonna be all right. Smash, smash, <laughs> smash. Why didn't no Carrie's fight tactics her? shocked the other members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, but she assured them, and this is a quote, ladies, you do not know how much joy you will have until you smash, smash, smash. Carrie power. became a household name, and she hoped her unusual tactics would spread across the country. But unfortunately, many of the women's movements eventually slowed down. Why? Well, because of this kind of thing. Thelma, I ripped my pants again. Ugh, well, you'll have to sew them yourself because I'm going out protesting. What? I don't know how to sew. What if I burn the house down and get eaten by alligators? What? Ha don't be stupid, <laughs> Mitch. Look, I've got to go. Call me stupid? She's the one who's stupid. Oh my god, please don't tell hey, me this. Hey, Thelma, way. look who's stupid now! See, while the women were out protesting, there was nobody to do the cooking and cleaning and being seen and not heard, and they gradually had to return to their duties at home. But oh where the woman had got the ball rolling... Are you telling me that men were just so undomesticated that we couldn't be left alone in the house? <laughs> That's hilarious. What the fuck? The... <laughs> How did this stuff a social uprising just by being useless? God, we really are the best at everything. It's it's such a burden. Rolling, a new movement, was about to take that ball all the way to Washington, D.C. I'm talking about the Anti-Saloon League. The Anti-Saloon League was a political pressure group run by a very sweet looking old man. But don't let that deceive you. This guy was an evil genius. While the women's movements were interested in a whole range of issues, Wayne Wheeler and the Anti-Saloon League only cared about enemy number one. Wait, Mr. what were the issues? A whole range Prison reform, sanitization, child welfare, public health, alcohol, labor laws, women's suffrages. Ah, okay, so, okay, right. So, like, left-leaning, but centrist at the same time. 
range of issues. Wayne Wheeler and the Anti-Saloon League only cared about enemy number one, Mr. Al Cahol. And it was wrong for me to say left leaning there. Um, they're just kind of centrist issues, but you know what I mean. Wayne Wheeler and the Anti-Saloon League only cared about enemy number one, Mr. Al Cahol. And as a result, they were Alcohol. extremely effective. They were able to exploit the fears of the American people. And I mean everyone's fears. Here's how they did it. Hello, sir. Welcome to the liberal progressive rally. Why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. So. Well, I'm Patty, and I'm an immigrant from Ireland. And tell me, Patty, do you drink? Oh, yes. <laughs> I drink a lot. See, folks, people like Patty come here looking for a better life, only to end up drunk in the gutter. Don't worry, sir. We're going to help you. Hey, man, you're doing great. I just need you for one more thing. Hey, Christian conservatives. This is Patty. He's a dirty Catholic Irish immigrant who's come to destroy America with his alcohol-fueled debauchery! <laughs> Workers. I mean, that's pretty clever. That is very clever. If that sort of... I know it didn't happen like that, but to entice both groups like that is, is very clever. We're told alcohol was a capitalist ploy to keep them... Because, because I hate immigrants as well, so I can, I can appeal to that. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I, could, I was thinking about letting it slide and then I thought, no, I can't do that. They'll ban my channel. Workers were told alcohol was a capitalist ploy to keep them subjugated. Factory owners were told alcohol was making their irresponsible workers lazy. The black community was warned alcohol was hindering its progress, while racists were warned alcohol would turn black men into brutes. In one of the most confusing <laughs> eras of American politics, totally opposing groups found themselves agreeing on at least one thing. Alcohol was bad. The anti saloon league also made great use of propaganda, something prohibitionists have been doing. For vote, vote wet for my sex, vote dry for my. Uh, okay. For decades. Take this specimen, for example, that warns what will happen to you if you start drinking. Let's see. First, you take a drink, you get a little rowdy. <laughs> okay. You make some new friends. Nice. Then you become homeless. You turn to crime. And. Uh. Uh. Oh. But the most effective tactic Wheeler used to force prohibition on America was pressure politics. In any election he could, Wheeler very successfully rounded up support against any politician who was in favor of alcohol. In Ohio alone, he had 70 state representatives and the popular Republican governor ousted from office and replaced with prohibitionists. Suddenly, every politician in America was afraid of Wayne Wheeler. Even those who enjoyed alcohol in private began pretending to be against it in public. Alcohol is delicious. Up. I mean, malicious. Sorry, Wayne. I'm really drunk right now. Then it really hit the fan in 1917, when America found itself fighting in the First World War against Germany. Anti-German sentiment exploded. Sauerkraut became liberty cabbage. German measles became liberty measles. And Dachshunds became the embodiment of evil. See, America? You've always been this way. The biggest brewers in America were German, and Wheeler saw to it that drinking alcohol became akin to pro-German treason. The German brewers desperately tried to fight back, creating their own propaganda, presenting beer as a healthy beverage, one that you could even give to your kids. As you can imagine, it okay. didn't go down well. President Wilson instituted some temporary wartime prohibition measures to save grain for food, and with many in the country now in support of prohibition, all that was left was to make it law. One problem was that taxes... I mean, from my understanding, America even though it committed a lot of military might, it wasn't exactly stretched in the resources front. So, when Woodrow Wilson was cutting back on wheat, you know, for, for food and that, you know, I, feel, I, I feel like that was also a ploy. Wilson instituted some temporary wartime prohibition measures to save grain for food, and with many in the country now in support of prohibition, all that was left was to make it law. One problem was that taxes on alcohol made up nearly 40% of the US government's annual revenue. And the government wasn't just about to give that up. No problem. The Anti-Saloon League helped lobby for the creation of a new income tax on the American people. And just like that, the government was no longer reliant on alcohol. Prohibition was finally introduced to Congress in 1913. I didn't know Not that. just as a law, but a constitutional amendment. In 1917, as the House held their final vote on the Prohibition Amendment, Wheeler was watching from the gallery. You spineless cowards. I know half of you drink, yet here you are bowing down to Ned Flanders up there. Look at him, <laughs> like he's some kind of Caesar. Ugh, don't be so dramatic. I obviously don't think I'm Caesar. Now release the lion. <laughs> In the end, Prohibition passed the House easily. 282 votes to 128, Shit. and the states ratified the new amendment by 1919. America, a nation obsessed with liberty and freedom, 
had just voluntarily given up its private right to choose whether or not to drink alcohol. We did it, folks. We fixed everything. America will be perfect forever. But you just dissolved America's fifth largest industry and lost tens of thousands of jobs for us immigrants. No, you idiot. You don't get it. We helped you, idiot. Ugh, I could really go for a beer. Oh, no. <laughs> Immediately after Prohibition went into effect, I'll What's this? What the birth shop? Who needs a liver? Oh, okay, because he's drunk, I get it. Who needs a liver anyway? My head hurts and a kale smoothie, anyone? Oh my god, what a liberal shithole. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Alcohol consumption in America decreased as Americans followed the law and tried not drinking. Man, if we're gonna be law-abiding good boys, we need something else to fill the dark, lonely void that delicious beer once did. Well, crack. how about we crack open a nice cold can of water? <laughs> Hell yeah, toss it over. Nah, this isn't doing it for me. Hey, you know what that reminded me of? You know that bit in, um, near the end of Wolf of Wall Street, and he's like, hey, do you want a non-alcoholic beer? And he's like, I don't get it. He's like, it's non-alcoholic. And he's like, yeah, but if I drink enough of them, I'll get fucked up, right? And he's like, no. <laughs> That's what that reminds me of. Nah, this isn't doing it for me. Let's try <coughs> it. This isn't <laughs> filling the dark void at all. Want to play some kites? Ah, screw it. Let's go get some illegal beer. While it seemed like many Americans supported prohibition, after the law went into effect, it seemed like just as many Americans intended to keep on drinking, and they would go on to find a variety of ways to break the new law. Here's a question for you. Do you like breaking the law? Well, shame on you. Or do you like saving money when you shop online? Then you should use honey. Do you ever shop in store? Of course not. Then you'd have- Um, yeah, go check out over Simplified's channel. I'm just skipping the advert for like, for me, but you know, all support to him. Procuring pints. Pretty soon after the new law went into effect, the failures of prohibition were already beginning to rear their ugly heads. For starters, the details of the new prohibition law, written by none other than Wayne Wheeler himself, turned out to be more draconian than expected. Many prohibition supporters only wanted to outlaw hard liquor and hoped beer would remain legal, but the Volstead Act outlawed anything over 0.5%. That would make is it weird that the law sounds German itself? <laughs> Volstead. Beer would remain legal, but the Volstead Act outlawed anything over 0.5%. That would make Liberty 0.5. Cabbage illegal. Secondly, the new law was full of loopholes that Americans very quickly began to exploit. For example, while the sale and manufacture of liquor was illegal, drinking it wasn't. And you could also keep any alcohol you had before the law went into effect. So many right. private clubs hoarded huge amounts of alcohol that saw them through the entire prohibition period. Whiskey intended for medicinal purposes was also allowed, and doctors basically became bartenders. It looked as though a full-on epidemic had broken out, as there was a sudden surge in prescriptions for whiskey. Sacramental <laughs> wines used by churches and synagogues were also permitted. Orders for communion wine suspiciously skyrocketed by millions of gallons. And as rabbis had access to religious wine, suddenly everyone was becoming a rabbi. You had Rabbi Pat O'Leary, Rabbi LL Cool J, Rabbi Fluffy, <laughs> but don't worry. I'm sure all these definitely legitimate religious figures couldn't possibly be selling wine in the back alley after mass. Yep, definitely nothing strange going on here. New products also hit the shelves in stores, such as Vine Glow, a brick of dehydrated grape juice, itself not alcoholic and therefore perfectly legal. But the packaging did contain a strangely specific warning. After dissolving the brick in a gallon of water, do not place the liquid in a jug in the cupboard for 20 days, because <laughs> then it would turn into a wine. I'll take a thousand. Yes, sir. Now, at this point, I want you to think back for me, if America. you will, to the year 2005. You're the coolest kid around, and you convince your parents to rent the greatest movie of all time from your local blockbuster. But the movie starts with- Hey, 2005. You know what happened in 2005, if I'm not mistaken? Halo 2? Halo 2. I'm pretty sure it was 2005. With a strange message. Something about not downloading a car? You immediately disregard that and hop on Kazat to download the greatest song of all time and in the process, drain your dad's bank account with copious amounts of ransomware. You were breaking the law, you bad boy or girl, but did anyone come to arrest you? No. That's my point. If no one's enforcing a law while everyone's breaking it, is it really a law? And so it was with prohibition. See, the conservative-led governments of the decade were also the kind of people who believed in small government spending. So they'd passed a law that would be extremely difficult to enforce, but also didn't want to spend any of the money required to enforce it. 
The newly created Bureau of Prohibition only had 1,500 agents to cover the entire country. That's one agent for every 70,666 Americans in a massive country with 12,000 miles of coastline and one gigantic land border with Canada. Good luck, schmuckos. Yeah. And all these clever little loopholes people were using to score illegal booze were only just the beginning. America was about to devolve into alcohol-fueled criminal chaos. Wait, I'm trying to remember which criminal made the come up. The Al Capone. Al Capone during the Prohibition. Pretty sure it was. By outlawing it, Prohibition had made alcohol a precious commodity, and millions of Americans would become outlaws as they found a variety of ways to score illegal booze. For example, many Americans began making their own liquor. Illegal stills from making moonshine were found by Prohibition agents from the hills of Kentucky and the caves of Arizona to parking lots in major cities, and even in the homes of Prohibition-supporting politicians. Oh, come on now, fellas. I voted for Prohibition. I'm not gonna have an illegal still. What's this? That's my son, Freddy. <laughs> Say hi, Freddy. <laughs> Sir, this is obviously an illegal still. How dare you? Hey, what's this in the bathtub? That's bath water. Why does it taste like alcohol? Uh, here's a better question. Why are you tasting my bath water, weirdo? <laughs> Come on, Freddy. Let's get away from these perverts. To discourage moonshining, the government began adding extra toxins to many of the products moonshiners were using, which resulted in many cases of severe illness and yeah, death. Yeah, what the fuck? But alcohol wasn't just being made at home. Along America's vast coastlines, rum runners smuggled alcohol into the country by sea. A floating supermarket known as Rum Row extended along the east coast just beyond America's maritime limit, and bootleggers frequently sailed out in small boats to pick up shipments of booze. These bootleggers could then be found selling their illegal products everywhere, even in the halls of Congress. Wow, Pop. One day, I want to work here. Well, son, <laughs> if you work hard and never give up, one day even you could be a massive hypocrite. Even President... Oh, is that Biden? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Jesus Christ. I'm too scared to even make political jokes in here anymore. Like, they might, I've said, like, fraud, like, three times in, like, a video, and the video just gets spammed with dislikes. I'm just like, oh, fuck my life. It was a joke. President Harding was known to serve his cabinet bootlegged whiskey, and some bootleggers were so successful, they became bazillionaires, such as Roy Olmsted, an ex-cop who became one of the biggest employers in the Seattle area from smuggling booze. Unfortunately, all of his whiskey came from Canada. Yuck. All of this criminality was being made possible by copious amounts of corruption. Across the country, armies of government officials were persuaded to turn a blind eye. Bootleggers became so rich, it was no problem to stuff a couple thousand dollars into the front pocket of the police chief, or the mayor, or their disapproving mother, and some cops were getting almost as rich as the bootleggers. All right, men, everyone gather in. I've received word that one of you has been taking bribes from bootleggers. Any ideas who? Kevin, perhaps. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I knew the feather hat was going to be there. One of you has been taking bribes from bootleggers. <laughs> any ideas who? Kevin, perhaps. Got any thoughts? No, sir. Many police officers came from the same communities that drank a lot, and they weren't about to arrest their own granddads for knocking back some homemade gin. But all this isn't to say there was no enforcement. Plenty of government officials were doing their best to enforce the new laws, and some unlucky individuals received very harsh penalties, such as a Michigan mother who was sentenced to life in prison for small-scale moonshining. Cases like these were widely reported in the media and only what served to make fuck? prohibition even more unpopular. But not just that. The media also loved to cover the exploits of the most famous bootleggers, turning them into national icons. One of the biggest bootleggers was a man named George Remus. Originally a lawyer, he watched as his bootlegger clients paid off enormous fines like it was nothing and proclaimed bootleggings the business for me. But unlike most bootleggers, Remus had big brain and he mm -hmm. came up with a pretty clever system. See, there were millions of gallons of liquor produced before Prohibition that were sitting in distillery warehouses and it could only be sold with government permission to drug companies. So Remus set up his own drug company and bought all the liquor. Then he set up his own transport company to transport the liquor. And then he would send his own men out with guns to intercept his own transport vehicles. And this would happen. Hey man, this is a stick up. Oh no, please don't hurt me. I won't hesitate to shoot. Please, I have a wife and kids. Hand over all the whiskey, fatty. Hey! Fatty isn't in the script, you <laughs> jerk! <laughs> After stealing all the whiskey from himself, he could then sell it for big bucks. The perfect crime. Unfortunately, Remus was eventually caught by a goody two-shoes prohibition director in Indiana who wouldn't take Remus's bribes, and the government found Remus guilty of violating the Volstead Act 3,000 times. For two years as Remus sat in prison, his wife promised to take care of all of his money. And by take care of his money, she meant have an affair with a prohibition agent, sell off everything Remus owned, and file for divorce. When Remus finally got out and found his big fancy mansion. Man, that's why we don't love them hoes, man. <laughs> man, you know what's funny though? 
Like, the one con- constant from all this is that the people that keep getting fucked keep getting fucked by women. <laughs> it's like, this is a real good period of time for women, man, because they were just giving it to us at this point. Take care of all of his money. And by take care of his money, she meant have an affair with a prohibition agent, sell off everything Remus owned, and file for divorce. When Remus finally got out and found his big fancy mansion empty with his wife gone, he reportedly broke down in tears. A few months later, during their divorce trial, he spotted his wife in a car in Cincinnati. Remus hopped in a cab and asked the driver to run her off the road. The driver was like, okay. Then Remus got out of the cab and shot his wife dead. He immediately handed himself into the police. And his next trial, this time for murder, became a national sensation. Remus defended himself, claiming insanity, occasionally carrying out skillful questioning, occasionally crying in the corner. But the nation felt bad for him. His wife had screwed him over, and so when after just 19 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned and declared him not guilty, the court erupted into celebration. And just to remind you, this guy bluntly admitted to murdering his wife. You know, as a person, this man's a piece of shit. But for the boys, he's, he's one of the boys. <laughs> nah, man, that's fucked up. I can't believe you got away with that. Yeah, walking into court and saying, yeah, I did it, man. But you won't believe what you put me through. And then the judge being like, oh, I feel you, man. <laughs> Not guilty. <laughs> the American justice system. <laughs> As alcohol poured into the nation, a lot of it was going to a new type of drinking establishment that had been booming in popularity. A secret drinking establishment. So secret that from the outside they often look like ordinary shops or homes. So secret that you usually needed a password to get in. So secret that everybody knew about them. Speakeasies. And once you were in, the party went all night long. Scantily clad flappers, snake ladies, jazz. It was a roaring time to be alive. Some publications even posted reviews of these illegal clubs, and bribes galore kept the party going. It seemed like half the police officers and federal agents in cities like New York were receiving kickbacks. Is that oversimplified? It seemed like half the police officers yeah, it is. Federal ag- <laughs> Who this? Face <Phaser. laughs> Agents in cities like New York were receiving kickbacks from speakeasy owners. Hey! What the Kevin Costner is going on here? Officer O'Hannity. Taking bribes? Why am I not surprised? Prohibition Director Simmons? For shame. Mom? Hey, does this guy remind you of uh, Russell Crowe, an American, uh, American gangster? You know that one cop that just has to ruin it? I think in that film, like he found like a million dollars and just handed it in. God, this is this is Russell Crowe. Not surprised. Prohibition director Simmons. For shame, mom. What would dad say? <laughs> Ask him yourself. Dad would say, quit being such a wet blanket and let daddy earn his tips. Anytime a speakeasy was shut down by authorities, it seemed like three more would just pop up elsewhere. And some neighborhoods were so full of them that one resident began hanging a sign to try to keep partygoers from constantly knocking on her door. It really seemed like the new laws regarding alcohol, in some places, were simply being ignored. And one prohibition agent who traveled the country liked to see which city was the most defiant by timing how long it took for him to be offered a beer after he arrived. His winner, New Orleans, where a cab driver offered him a drink after just 35 seconds. Bravo! (laughs) Many voices in Congress were already speaking out against prohibition and its failures. To display how ridiculous the whole thing was, one Republican congressman gathered the media to all come and watch him drink a homemade beer. When he asked a passing police officer if he'd like to arrest him, the officer said no. Hey Wayne, is all this what you had in mind? I thought we were going to make the country better, but it almost seems like it's worse. What do you mean? Alcohol consumption is down. Well, that may be true in your small town world, but it says here drinking in some areas is up. As are arrests for public intoxication, drunk driving, and incidents of liver cirrhosis. The general chaos has turned America into a nation of criminals with no respect for the law, and all these attempts at enforcement are just costing the economy valuable money and eating up judicial time and resources. Release the lines. The social change and corruption that Wheeler and the Anti-Saloon League had been so eager to prevent, in the cities at least, was surging. See, when something's legal, you can usually regulate and control it. But make that thing illegal, and often anything, becomes fair game. Legal drinking age, gone. Mandatory closing hours for clubs and bars, gone. 
other unspoken sociocultural rules surrounding women shouldn't get drunk, men and women shouldn't get drunk together, people shouldn't pee into their neighbor's mailbox while singing Danny, Danny Boy. Alcohol. Gone, <laughs> gone, gone. Oh, in speakeasies, boy. different genders and ethnicities were beginning to mingle in a way they hadn't done before. The Roaring Twenties saw a monumental shift in culture. That's Not good. least of all, because now men and women could flirt in public without being damned for eternity. An outraged Wayne Wheeler did his best- Ah, so, th okay, so th this is interesting. This kind of brought about the social change of how strict kind of like I don't know social mobility like lower classes talking to upper classes and genders talking to other genders publicly I guess I guess this what uh this is what Young was worried about. <laughs> now men and women could flirt in public without being damned for eternity. An outraged Sorry. Wayne Wheeler did his best to make sure that anyone breaking the law was punished. He had even stricter legislation put in place in New York. But all this did was clog up the justice system with petty drinking violations, and judges began letting everyone off with light fines so the judges could get back to dealing with things that actually mattered. You know, things like murder. And there was plenty of murder. Because bootleggers and moonshiners were one thing, but prohibition had given another kind of criminal an opportunity to make a fortune. Mobsters and gangsters. Hey, Fat Tony, big news. <laughs> hey, Fat Joey, what's up? I just got word from Fat Louie here that the government's outlawing alcohol. You know what that means. That means we're gonna be rich. Quick, call Fat Polly and let's go hijack a liquor <laughs> truck now. All right, hang on, let me tell my wife first. Hey, Fat Susan, no pizza for Fat Joey tonight, capiche? Stop calling me Fat Susan! Ah, oh, yeah, come on about it! Ah, walk ah, come it on. Rival gangs began to battle in America. What am I an asshole? Get the fuck out of here! Rival Hey, rival gangs began to battle in America's cities, raiding each other's transports, assassinating rivals, and trying to take control of their city's illicit booze trade. Every city had its top dog. Detroit had the Purple Gang. New England had Charles King Solomon. But no city was as infamous for gang violence and murder as Chicago. The city had multiple gang factions, and at first, they agreed to stay in their own neighborhoods. But the thing about criminals is that they're criminals, and the agreements inevitably broke down. One day, the leader of the Italian Southside gang was walking along the street when this happened. And he was like, you know, I think I'm done with this, and left for New York, leaving his crime empire to his chief enforcer, none other than Al Capone. Having been knifed in the face in his younger years, Capone <laughs> earned himself the name Scarface. Although interestingly, he hated that nickname and preferred to be called Snorky. Snorky was ruthless, just like any other gang leader in America. But what set him apart from others, the reason he's become synonymous with 1920s gang warfare, is this. Most other gang leaders would try to keep a low profile because, you know, they're killing and murdering and stuff. But Capone lived for the fame and kept an extremely high public profile frequently speaking with the media about his exploits and presenting himself as a gracious host, providing Chicago with good times. No need to thank me, fellas. I just provide the city with a valuable commodity while doing away with the competition. You mean you murder people? Whoa, who said anything about murder? I just, you know, force my rivals underground. When you do the thing with the hands, it seems like you're talking about murder. Whoa, <laughs> look at you with the brain. No, no, I just <laughs> help people- Hey, get a load of this fucking guy. What am I, an asshole? Hey, what is it? Uh... Oh no, I'm thinking of good fellas, don't matter. Don't matter. Don't mind me. Tire. From life. So murder. Whoa! Al Snorky Capone was somewhat of an enigma. Brutal in how he dealt with enemies. But in front of the camera, he was all smiles. One day, he'd be ordering hit after hit. The next, he'd be signing autographs in Wrigley Field. One day, he'd be bludgeoning members of his own gang with a baseball bat for conspiring against him. The next, he'd be playing Santa at a nearby parochial school. And no murder could ever be traced back to him. Just like every other criminal, he stuffed the pockets of city officials with cold, hard cash. And any who did try to oppose him sometimes found themselves being thrown down the steps of City Hall in broad daylight. Problem solved. The public couldn't get enough of Capone. He quickly became a household name as people romanticized the gang life he lived. And this became a source of concern for the people at the very top. Uh, President Hoover? Ugh, what is it now, Miles? I'm busy. Well, it's just that there's a lot of crime, sir. Crime? How long's that been happening? Well, since the dawn of man, sir. <laughs> what? Would you like me to blame it on the Democrats again? No, Miles, I want you to blame it on squirrels. Yes, the Democrats. Now stop wasting my time. Since well, having a crime lord question. controlling public officials and winning the hearts of the people probably wasn't a good thing, Hoover personally ordered that something be done about this Capone fellow. But before he knew it, President Hoover was also dealing with another major problem. You know him. You love him. Woman. 
The Prohibition era had been going on for nearly a decade, and anyone with a brain could see that it really wasn't going very well. One person with a brain was Pauline Sabin, an extremely influential and rich woman who served on the Republican National Committee, fundraised for Republican presidents, and had a secret wine room in her giant mansion. She initially supported Prohibition, but was now disgusted at the chaos it had created, and she began a new women's movement, this time not for Prohibition, but against it. Being the extremely influential woman she was, her new organization gained nearly 1.5 million members within two years, five times that of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She hated that the WCTU claimed to speak for all women, and she began calling for the repeal of the 18th Amendment. President Hoover, I helped fund your campaign, and now I want you to end prohibition. Miles, what is it I say when I'm not going to do anything? You'll look into it, sir. Oh yeah, that's right. Pauline? I'll look into it. Sabin gave speeches on the steps of Congress and helped start a growing push among the American people against prohibition. But Hoover, a prohibitionist himself, wasn't budging. Then, on the 14th of February, 1929, something happened that shocked the nation. Men, thought to be working for Al Capone, tricked some Irish mobsters into meeting them at a garage in Chicago, thinking they were there to purchase hijacked whiskey. Instead, the mobsters were lined up against the wall by men dressed as police, and they were shot. The Valentine's Day Massacre had people outraged. It was cruel and almost felt like American mobsters had finally crossed a line. People were sick of the violence, and in part, they blamed Prohibition <laughs> for helping to create it. The pressure on Hoover to do something was steadily increasing. Fine. Miles, I want you to put a report together to see if this whole thing is working. You mean, the thing where mobsters are becoming increasingly powerful and massacring each other in the streets and everyone is disregarding the law and half our public officials are corrupt and taking bribes? That thing? Yeah, I want to know if it's working or not, Miles. Stop wasting my time! Hoover continued to drag his feet on prohibition, but after the Valentine's Day massacre, he was still determined to do one thing. He wanted Al Capone in prison. Since Capone had been so careful, the FBI were having a hard time charging him with anything, but eventually, they got him. Capone, we know you're supplying Chicago with alcohol and you've been involved in countless murders. Whoa, look at you with the crazy talk. I ain't done none of that stuff. But you're rich, right? You're damn right I am. And so where'd all the money come from, Capone? All right, I'll let you in on a little secret, but you gotta promise not to tell anyone, okay? I don't pay my taxes. Whoa! The, 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 murdering, the IRS finally got Capone on tax evasion. At his trial, he didn't seem too concerned though, and spent most of his time having a laugh with his lawyers. Hey Capone, I gotta know, why are you so confident you're gonna win here? Well, your honor, because I'm an honest man with a big heart, who's passionate about working for the good of the people. And also because I threatened the entire jury's families. Luckily, at the last minute, the judge replaced the entire jury pool with a new one that Capone's men hadn't yet got to, and Capone was found guilty. He was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison, the harshest penalty ever given to a tax evader. Yeah. But even with Capone locked away, the violence in Chicago and other cities continued. And in response, the movement against Prohibition continued to grow. And the final nail in Prohibition's coffin came in 1929. After a decade of booming economic growth under three Republican presidents, the stock market plummeted, and America was thrown into the grips of the Great Depression. It was an awful time. One out of every five workers, 15 million people, would lose their jobs. Half the nation's banks failed. Temporary shanty towns were built for the broken homeless Jeez. in public parks. Suddenly, very few people had time to care about prohibition. Expensive enforcement of an unenforceable law didn't seem like that big of a priority when people were having their homes repossessed and losing their life savings. And many began to argue that repealing prohibition would create vital jobs and tax revenue for the government. Yet President Hoover doubled down. Here's that report you asked for, sir. Give me. Prohibition is great. Fantastic news. Uh, sir, it says here prohibition is great at undermining the rule of law in America. Miles, it says the word great. That means good. Now stop wasting my time. The public, increasingly shocked at the violence they saw in the streets, the corruption they saw in the government, the general disregard for the law, and now an economic calamity had had enough. For his re-election, Hoover faced a Democratic candidate who promised to finally do something about prohibition, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Crowds cheered as FDR made his campaign speeches promising to modify the Volstead Act, and Pauline Sabin, a lifelong Republican, along with her 1.5 million supporters, endorsed Roosevelt. And on election day, it was a landslide. Before FDR had even taken office, Republicans Jesus, in Congress- Jesus, was that the actual map? Election day, it was a landslide. Fraud. <laughs> Before FDR had even taken office, Republicans in Congress began the process of passing the 21st Amendment to repeal prohibition. 
One of FDR's first acts as president was to pass the Beer Permit Act, which made beer legal while the new amendment was being ratified. In 1933, with the passage of the 21st Amendment, prohibition was finally over, and the people celebrated like they'd just won a world war. Bars and taverns were packed. The WCTU <laughs> were inconsolable. Wayne Wheeler was dead. And the celebration, particularly in America's okay, cities, was intense. Heading into the mid-1930s, the effects of prohibition were America's Sorry, I just got, I was kind of captured by this guy's face. Like, it, look, just look at all the smiles and the happiness from everyone. And this guy's like, hmm. <laughs> like, what is he looking at? Cities was intense. <laughs> Heading into the mid-1930s, the effects of prohibition were clear to see. From now on, culture around drinking had changed, with men and women drinking together, not in saloons, but in bars and taverns. The crime syndicates that had been given so much power through prohibition remained powerful as they moved on to other things. Some states opted to remain dry, with Oklahoma only repealing its prohibition laws in 1959. Shit. To this day, there are still counties in America with some form of prohibition. So what did we learn today, kids? What's the big lesson here? What's the moral of this story that we can all take away and apply to our day-to-day -day lives? Maybe that you mm. shouldn't force your own morals on others who don't share them? Mm. Maybe that if you tell Americans not to do something, that's the one thing they'll definitely do. Mm. Or maybe there is no lesson. Maybe we're all just a bunch of dumb, stinky idiots, and we're all doomed. The end. I mean, what is the moral of the story? Freedom. I think that's the moral. Just let people do what you want, man. You know, unless it's crack or heroin. Oh, oh, oh. oh. I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna say it. Um, yeah. I hope you've all enjoyed that, man. I, I learned a lot. I don't know about you. I learned a hell of a lot. I thought I knew some stuff about the prohibition. Turns out I didn't know a lot at all. Um, make sure you go check out Over Oversimplify's channel. Um, obviously, he's done all the work, but not me. I'm just reacting to it. But a like and a comment subscribe for me would be great but at the end of the day it's this dude right here so uh yeah man i hope you've all enjoyed that i really do um like comment subscribe and i'll i'll see you soon man peace out